the first Sunday after Thanksgiving. <clears throat> I've just had the holidays and things have been uh, exciting. There's been a lot of hustle and bustle, family and friends, and now we enter the stretch run towards Christmas and New Year's. Well, what are your expectations? You sit down and you come out of these holidays. What is it that you anticipate? What do you prepare for uh, in this last uh, segment of this coming year, or of this year? <clears throat> well, uh, from the East Coast, as a New Yorker, insert sarcastic comment here, for me, this time of the year was a time to look back, a time to reflect on the, the, the green of the summer, the bright sunshine, the warmth, and then look forward in expectation to the beautiful colors of gold and brown and red of the fall and the cool air. And then, of course, beyond that, to the cold snowy, wintry, gray of the winter season. Well, this was the time for the preparation for Christmas. We expected it, I, you know, we looked towards that day when we would get our gifts and when I would <clears throat> look to see what I didn't get that year. Uh, Christmas at our place was a bit dysfunctional, needless to say. But that's usually what occurs at this time of the year. What is it that you expect? What are you um, looking for? How are you preparing for those things that are going to be coming uh, this time of the year? Uh, we, I used to be able to figure out what my friends were, were expecting. Uh, we all pretty much grew up at the same time. We all essentially knew what was coming. Uh, and I used to be able to pretty much figure out what you know society and what the world was looking for, but not anymore. Uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, within the past month, it certainly became clearer that uh, the world's, if you will, uh, pulse was easier to figure out in reference to uh, what they're expecting this coming fall. Uh, whether it's the newest Lady Gaga CD, and the fact that I even know that person's name just drives me to distraction. Uh, whether it's the newest music video, whether it's the next blockbuster movie, all of these things would be things that the world expected. But there is one thing that I can guarantee you will focus the attention of the world uh, for some time to come. And that was made at an announcement on 16 November of this past month. Anybody remember what that was? Sorry, I'm not going to ask you to answer. 16th of November, Prince William announced his engagement and eventual marriage to Kate Middleton. Now, I know that this is going to preoccupy <laughs> the world for the next six, seven months because it already has. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, it doesn't matter. You look at any of the major news stations and they're already focusing on this event. We are the only country, well, I shouldn't say the only, but we're probably one of the few countries that separates itself from its monarch and then obsesses over its monarch for the rest of its life. But there it is, 16 November to 29 April. Mark those days on your calendar. Which brings me to another point before we begin. We as human beings are intrinsically tied. We are gripped by time. We can't get away from it. Our entire existence is marked, if you will, and measured by time. Think about this just for a second. Almost everything we do, we do based upon dates. I've just mentioned one. And everybody went, oh yeah, of course, yeah, no big deal. Eh, right. Well, December 7th, 1941. Everybody knows that date, right? Well, we should. Pearl Harbor. June 6th, 1944, D-Day. November 23rd, 1963, assassination of President Kennedy. And of course, 11 September, 2001. 
We mark our existence as humans by dates. Birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, etc. They become paramount in our lives. <clears throat> and we each have our own special dates. Two for me stand out prominently. And they, of course, they <laughs> mark out my own particular schizophrenia. One is January 28th, 2005. It was the death of my son in Iraq. The other is August 13th, 1995. That was the death of Mickey Mantle, my childhood idol. So it's just a twist that I am. But the point is this. We come to this time of the year, we come to Advent, with if you will, an almost oblivious attitude towards the importance of liturgical dates. And Advent, and I'm hoping to show that today, Advent becomes one of the most significant periods in the church year because in that Advent period, in this four-week period from today up until Christmas, Advent presents a microcosm, if you will, of the entire church calendar. And because it presents a microcosm of the church calendar, it therefore presents a microcosm of each and every life of a Christian. And hopefully I'll show that in a minute. Have you ever thought about Advent? I'm sure it's crossed your mind. And how is it that you view Advent? Well. Generally speaking, and I, and, and I hope I don't insult anybody by saying this, but most people view Advent as the period preceding Christmas. They view Advent as that time which looks towards Christmas Day. Well, the interesting thing is, in the Book of Common Prayer, that is not how Advent is presented. From morning prayer until the Gospel selections on each Sunday, Advent is viewed as the coming of the king. In the antiphon and morning prayer, one of the very first sentences we read is, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So, in this period of Advent, we are focusing on the comings of Jesus. We focus on his arrival in history as a baby born of Mary, his first advent. We focus upon his return in history, in fearsome glory at the end of time, his second advent. But I hope we would also begin to recognize that in advent, we focus on his entrance into our own lives. During this period, of, during advent, we are engaged by the prophets of Israel, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Micah, Malachi, Zechariah, and their messianic visions. We are confronted by John the Baptist's stern call to prepare for Jesus by repenting. And we are beckoned to walk with Mary and Joseph in their anxiety and their expectation. Advent presents the sober teachings of Jesus and his apostles on the judgment to come at the end of the age. So there is a full spectrum of events that are going on during this four-week peri uh, four period in Advent. And in that four-week period, we can see the church calendar, the rest of the church here, unfold. In the early centuries, however, the churches in the East, they celebrated both the birth of Jesus and the baptism of Jesus on January 6th. So not surprisingly, the 6th of January became a major occasion for performing baptisms, which led to a period of preparation, fasting, catechesis, self-examination, and of course, spiritual readiness. In the church in Rome, however, Advent entailed a festive preparation for the birth of Jesus, almost from the outset. So in the sixth century, Pope Gregory the Great established the forerunner of our current Advent season by creating four special services on Sunday preceding Christmas. After seesawing over the ensuing centuries, these two traditions, the warm 
Latin joy, so to speak, and the ascetic Greek preparation, they eventually merged into the synthesis that characterizes Advent to this day. Well, in preparation for the first Advent, we see that the church has presented us with selections from Scripture in the Book of Common Prayer, and Scripture presents us with the birth narratives that indicate that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea. He was born of a virgin mother that was descended from David, and he was born in humble circumstances in 4 B.C. Now, although the world at large, and even the Jewish world, was unaware of the event, it was entirely unobserved and uh, nor unexpected. Think about this just for a second. We come to the birth narratives of Jesus at this, in, in this Advent period, and what do we see? We see the angelic announcement of Jesus' birth, first to Mary, then to Joseph. But that announcement, that angelic pronouncement, points back, if you will, to the angelic announcements of the birth of Isaac to Abraham, in Genesis 17, the birth of Samson in Judges 13, and of course, John the Baptist in Luke 1. So in both of these announcements to Mary and to Joseph, mention was made of the action of the Holy Spirit in the conception of the child, the name to be given him, the nature of his mission. Combine this with the previous angelic announcements that we've just seen and we are led to automatically recognize that something profound was going to happen. But it doesn't end there. Pious shepherds learned of the Savior's birth from an angel who was then joined by an angelic choir praising God above the sheep pastures of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread which automatically brings to mind that the house of bread was going to produce the bread of life, Jesus. A brilliant star in the ancient prophecy of Micah guided a company of magi, wise men, to the, ancient, uh, to the place where they found the infant savior. And of course, we immediately think of the true wisdom, the truth, the way, and the life, Jesus. The period was marked by a revival of prophetic song preceding and following the birth. The pointing to the messianic vision, the songs of Elizabeth, Mary, Zacharias, and Simeon, they revealed a close familiarity with the scriptures that these people had and the reverent, expectant piety that characterized them in the circles in which they originated. Luke chapter 1, 42, 46, 68, Chapter 2 presents to us passages of Scripture which to this day we still love and adore. The Benedictus, the Magnificat, and the Nuctimitus. And the composers, the people that I've just mentioned, along with the shepherds and Anna, represent a God-fearing minority at the time of the Advent whose attitude is variously described as waiting for the consolation of Israel and looking for the redemption in Jerusalem. Matthew not only points to Micah's prophecy, but he points to several other prophecies as well. Of course, Matthew talks about uh, Isaiah 7, and the virgin shall conceive a child. Matthew talks about Hosea 11, that my son will come out of Egypt. And of course, he talks about Jeremiah 31, Rachel's weeping. Well, he also draws attention indirectly to the fulfillment of earlier prophecies. I mean, excuse me, uh, of earlier promises, when he traces the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham and David. And Matthew was pointing to the legal and the royal descent, in virtue of which Joseph and Jesus, as his adopted son, would have claim to the Davidic throne. And lest we forget, there's Luke's genealogy, which would appear to present the natural line to which Joseph ultimately, as the husband of Mary, belonged. The divine was intruding 
into the human arena, bringing with it all that that heavenly intrusion implies. Yet, in contrast to these pleasing evidences of sincere religious aspiration, the birth narratives also provide a glimpse of the incredulous indifference of the official interpreters of Scripture. Remember the King's Council and a dark picture of the sinister hostility of King Herod. This time in the history of the world which brings forth the King is called by the Apostle Paul the fullness of time. That both the predestinating power of God and his providential molding of the existing conditions of the world rendered this specific particular time in history perfect for the Savior's coming. Think. Since 63 BC, Palestine had been a part of the greatest empire the world had known up to that time. Rome had its strategic placement of its soldiers for protection. It had methods of provincial government that provided organization and continuity. Extensive roads linking Rome with the farthest reaches of the empire for continual contact. The seas were swept clear of the marauding pirates of the Carthaginians and the Philistines and the Egyptians. There was ease of trade, a commonness of communication, freedom of religion, and of course, <clears throat> the Pax Romana, peace in Rome. And yet, even with all of these favorable conditions, Palestine, because of the Jewish dispersion, contained only a small fraction of the Jews scattered throughout the empire. However, even with this small representation, not all was perfect. Throughout the empire and Judaism, there was wide moral corruption, increasing pessimism, spiritual hunger, and weakening of racial barriers between the Jews and non-Jews. And interestingly, that last point indicates the widespread spiritual laxity and compromise prevalent in religious circles at that time. Sound familiar? Do you think we could draw a parallel of that to today? And yet, with all of these conditions, the foundation was laid for all the evidence of the grace and goodness of God as exhibited in the life of Jesus. His life was preparatory for the atonement, which is the sole basis of forgiveness and of reconciliation to God. And this, beloved, is the foundation of the first advent. Because when one looks at the Gospels during this time in the Book of Common Prayer, one sees not a focus upon Jesus' birth, not a focus on Christmas, but upon his coming as king. Against the background of his historical appearance in the flesh, Jesus taught that he was coming again. Look at Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, just to name a few of the major passages. This line of teaching presupposes, this teaching of the second coming, presupposes the victory of the resurrection of the first advent. The two advents can be thought of, if you will, after the manner of the Old Testament prophets, as aspects of the one great divine intervention in human life through the person of the Messiah. Almost like a, I don't want to use that word because it's theologically problematic, but it's, it's as if there's a rainbow. Let's look at it that way. From the first advent to the second advent, there's this link. The great Swiss theologian Oscar Kuhlmann captures our imagination of these two advents and their relation to history by using the illustration of D-Day and V-E-Day. So in this illustration, uh, Coleman presupposes the relationship between what Jesus did at his first coming, his first advent, and what he will do when he comes again. 
Once the decisive battle of a war has been won, the final outcome is assured. The interval elapsing between the ultimate manifestation and celebration of victory is, however, uncertain and is of an uncertain duration. So, Coleman wants to say we have D-Day, we have the first advent, the victory was won. We wait for the second advent, but we already know that the battle and the war is over. We, I mean, we already know that the war is over, we just have to fight the skirmishes until we get there. Same thing in his analogy of D-Day. But he then goes on to argue that Jesus' parousia, his coming, and don't get, don't get all twisted about these theological words. They're helpful tools. They give us places on which we can hang concepts, and we'll be talking about a couple more of them in a minute. So just relax, and I'll explain them. Parousia means coming. So Coleman argues that Jesus' parousia, Jesus' coming, is not the decisive event of the gospel. Hang with me. It is rather the inevitable sequel of the decisive event, which took place with his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And now do you see why I say that the Advent period, this four-week period, encapsulates the entire church year and therefore informs your entire Christian life? The ascension, the crucifixion, the resurrection, it talks about the time of preparation. It talks about repentance. We talk about in preparation for the coming king. We need to prepare ourselves to be included in the kingdom. We need to be uh, invited to have that kingdom sign, baptism. And then, as a part of our inclusion into the kingdom, we need to be acceptable by the king. So we need to be justified. And then in our justification, we are spiritually fed the Eucharist, which then moves to enhance our spiritual growth and sanctification. And on and on I can go. With the work accomplished by Jesus at his first advent, the eschatological epic has been inaugurated. Now, eschatological, ooh, it's another $10, $10 word. Very simply, you hear eschatology a lot talked about, and everybody says, oh, last things. Yeah, that's kind of what it means. Here's a thumbnail definition of eschatology. Eschatology is the intrusion of the heavenly realm into the earthly realm that drives us to the consummation. Very simple. It's very simple. Heaven intrudes into earth and moves us towards the consummation. And that, that line is this way. Okay, So it's not as though it's just bing, bing, not an L, but it's a movement, heaven, earth, moving towards the consummation. Keep that in mind. Very simple. The slaughtered lamb, then, has vindicated his title to be the lord of history. The consummation of the eschatological epoch is as closely bound up with his person as the inauguration was. In other words, his second coming is so intrinsically related to who he was, it mirrors his first coming, because it was so intrinsically related to who he was, the king. And this connection is so close that in 2 Thessalonians it's called the epiphany of his parousia, or literally the manifestation of his presence. Now, we've all heard the term uh, parousia, well, we should have heard the term parousia before. And usually it's understood as coming. But when we apply it to Jesus' second coming, it's better understood as his presence. So it's intended to have a somewhat technical force, as it was used in the Hellenistic days, for denoting the arrival, this is key, of a king or a person of prominence. His second coming denotes the arrival of a king or a person of prominence. He has been vindicated by God, by his resurrection. Although, as we saw on D-Day and V-E Day, that vindication has yet to be universally revealed and acknowledged. And when we hear the word revealed, we usually associate that with apocalypse. We've all heard the term, oh, it's apocalyptic. We'll get to that in just a second. So this vindication 
is known to us and yet to be known to the outside world. But the believer, and get this, this is critical, who lives now between the times and awaits the manifestation of his presence, experiences already the assurance of his presence, the assurance of his second advent, the assurance of his abiding as victor and deliverer. This parousia of Jesus is closely associated in the New Testament with the resurrection of his people, more generally the world, and with the judgment of mankind. So while the people of Jesus experience the resurrection life here and now, those who refuse him are condemned already and stand to wait the future judgment. The gospel, which almost distinctively emphasizes that judgment of the world, coincided with the incarnation and passion of Christ, Gospel of John, John 12, and that believers in him already possess eternal life, John 3, speaks plainly of a resurrection to be effected by Christ at the last day, John 6. Now, this final revealing to the world, this apocalypsis, if you will, usually means unveiling. That's how it's generally uh, communicated to us. But keep this in mind, because what it literally means is the laying bare or the making naked, or in other words, the complete exposure and revelation. When Jesus comes back in his second coming, he will come back completely revealed, completely exposed, completely manifested as the king of the world, as the conquering warrior, as the Lion of Judah, there will be no question. And we know he shall appear because we understand it as confident anticipation which we mentally and spiritually see and perceive or we look at. The writer of the Hebrews gave a great example. In Hebrews chapter 9, the writer speaks of the high priest of going into the, ta into the tabernacle or the, the, the temple. He had the bells in the end of his tunic. He had the rope tied around his ankle because if he had sin, he would die in the most holy place. The Day of Atonement, once a year he would go in. And they have the rope just in case they, you know, the bells didn't ring, they could yank him out because nobody else could go in there. But they all sat there and they were waiting for him to appear. They were waiting for him to appear. They were waiting for him to appear. And we don't have any record in scripture that any high priest died in there. So we know he always appeared. He came out of the holy place, and we know that Christ shall appear because our high priest has entered the holy place once and for all. And when he comes back, he will come back to bring us into that most holy place. Here's an important, very important concept to keep in mind, this appearance. The high priest emerges to the people so that they can see him from the most holy place. And we know that Jesus will appear to us as he emerges from the most holy place. He will manifest himself. If I said to you that Jesus would epiphania, would you know what I mean? Think for just a second, epiphania. Yeah, it's where we get our word epiphany. And in 2 Timothy 4, the word is used as a public, open display of Christ's character and appearing. And it associates itself with the idea of glory and, and sudden, conspicuous nature. The sudden, conspicuous nature of the, the manifestation of Christ's character. And because of that, it's overwhelming effects on hostile powers. This is the epiphany of Christ. This is what we see in the second coming. This is what we understand the totality of Advent to be. But even more interestingly, the word epiphany in its etymological roots was used by Greek writers 
to denote a glorious manifestation of the gods, especially their advent to help. The epiphany of Christ is the glorious manifestation of God to intervene, to help, to rescue his people. Wow, that's, that's, a, lot, that's a lot to consider when we consider Advent. And, and to seriously attend to, to these things, both eschatological and historical, in a few weeks, that's really tough. Especially when these are weeks that, for many of us, are the busiest and the most demanding of the year. I mean, uh, how can we experience Jesus uh, coming anew in our uh, already full lives? I mean, how can we be absorbed in hope when we're so harried? How can we live our lives in, in, to be enlarged in so brief a time? How can we prepare for our king? Well, we can look at Elizabeth and Zechariah. They can help us. We can see their son John, and he can help us. We can look at the young Mary. I'm sure she can help us. We can enter into those stories and we can listen to their words and we can pray their prayers over these weeks. And by so doing, when we deepen, we will deepen our longing and heighten our hope for God's coming. And by so doing, we become more attuned to the joyous wonder of Jesus' incarnation and better prepared for the fierce glory of his return. His first advent and his second advent. By so doing, year after year, year, we will be changed as word becomes flesh dwelling in us. So, what are your expectations and preparations? How do you spend the time of Advent? Are you expecting a glorious Christmas? Are you looking for a lot of gifts? Are you preparing for that? Are you concerned with the material things? Are you going to be obsessing about Prince William and Kate? Or are you going to look at this Advent season and you're going to take the first Advent, the glorious intrusion of the heavenly king into the earthly realm, and prepare yourself daily because Advent is the microcosm of the church year, and if you do that, you prepare yourself for your life. Do you confess your sin? Do you recognize your baptismal vows? Do you acknowledge that Christ is your sole justification? That it is by faith in him alone? Do you acknowledge that his Eucharist fee is, a, is one of the ways he feeds you by grace? so that you may sanctify your lives, so that you can live a life of preparation for his second coming. Because we as Christians who live in the time between the two advents already have the victory. And this should motivate us more than anything else to tell our friends, our family, our neighbors, and the people that we meet that if they are outside of this community, they are in darkness, and they stand outside the kingdom. Imagine, if you will, and I'll close with this. Look around. Whether it's our community here or another church community. That community <clears throat> is God's representation of his kingdom on earth. And it is only within that kingdom that one can find salvation. Outside of that kingdom is despair. Should we not bring that kingdom to them? Should we not share the glorious joy of our victory in the first advent with them so that they can avoid the horror that they will experience in the second advent? Our joy lies in both advents. What are you expecting to do? And for what are you preparing in this Advent season?